Ta, and welcome to the Philadelphia Assembly. Uh, shalom on the Sabbath day. There's a lot going on out there in the world right now, and just remember who's in control. Let's don't always don't let's don't jump to uh, conclusions outside of what makes sense. Okay, there's a lot of uh, what I will call conspiracy theories going on out there. I'm just not trying to pay attention to them. I just want to keep my eyes focused on our Mashiach, our Messiah, and do what he would do. And that is, number one, be obedient. You know, we know that we're supposed to uh, follow the laws of our land and, you know, be a good examples to others. And right now uh, makes good common sense, regardless of where this started from or whatever, to listen and uh, and you know, stay inside, as they've told you. Or, you know, that doesn't mean that you can't go outside and walk your dog or do anything like that. But right now, while this uh, virus is out there, it's a good idea to uh, shelter in as it is. You know, here in Illinois, we've kind of been uh, put in a position where they've asked us to shelter in. It's it's not uh, something where they're going to uh, put it, people in jail. If they go outside, we're able to go out, walk our dogs, do all that, go to the grocery store, go to the gas station, you know, pharmacy, whatever that a person needs to do that's uh, important. You know, obviously they're doing it, but they're recommending you to shelter in at this time. And, you know, if you're an older person and you've got outlay, you know, outstanding health conditions besides that, there's even more reason to do that. Uh takes faith sometimes to stay inside. Don't be foolish and think that, you know, hey, you know, I'm protected. I can do it. Yeah, you're protected. But we can remember when uh, the apostle Shaul, he reached into the fire and he got bit by a snake. He didn't see a snake in there and reach in and intentionally get bit. He got bitten and God protected him from that. You know, in Matthew chapter four, it said, tempt not the Lord thy God. Our Messiah said that. And when, when Satan told him to cast himself down from the temple and that elite, the angels would catch him, you know, he said, tempt not the Lord thy God. Now think about that. You know, in, in perspective, we don't want to be tempting God either. You know, just like in the time of the Passover, when uh, the Israelites were instructed to stay inside there all night and don't come out because the death angel was passing over the whole country of Egypt at that point. OK, he's going to kill the firstborn in that example. We know that's just an example. That was a real factual thing that happened. But it's, we can look at that and see the examples for today. So this might be a long time uh, for us to be shut in. But we need to be have faith and keep faith in God and keep on living our life and not let our fear be robbed. You know, look, fear take away our joy. That's what I meant to say. OK, we need to keep focused and realize that we are under that shed blood of our Messiah that they painted over those doorposts. That was a lamb and that was symbolic. But now we do have the, the sacrificial lamb has been offered for the sins of the world. And now we have that blood that's over our doorpost of our heart. And so let's just all stay fa uh, faithful together in keeping Yahuwah's commandments and acting in the same manner as our Mashiach, our Messiah, Yahushua did, and not be afraid, you know, uh, but also don't be foolish, okay? Make sure you take the proper precautions as you're warned to, and, and, and just live your life in the best way you can. Now's a good time to bond with family members. Now's a good time to become closer together in that, in that family. And the other thing is, it's, now's a good time to be in the Word, to be studying and rightly dividing this word in such a way that it gives us encouragement. Uh, we're going to continue to um, do our expository teaching. I thought about, you know, teaching on other things this morning, but, you know, I don't want to draw any conclusions that would be, you know, out of context and probably pull us away, that could possibly pull us away from the truth. I want to remain in this. We're going to continue our expository teaching in 2 Samuel, uh, this is part two of the teaching, and we're going to start in chapter eight. We're first going to open in prayer, okay? And we're going to pray for everybody, and I'd like for all of us to be praying together, you know, at, 
every day. Let's all set a time like 12 o'clock noon every day for the believers to sit down. We don't have to notify each other. We don't have to be online, but all every day about 12 o'clock, let's all pray for the whole entire earth that uh, the hedge would be around them. But today is, according to Yahuwah's calendar, as we discern it, it's the 12th day of the 13th month. That would be the uh, Adar 2, if you were using the names for the Hebrew calendar. Uh, it's, it's uh, again, the 12th day of the 13th month of the year 5779. And it's the 21st day of the third month, or the 21st of March 2020, on the Gregorian calendar. And, you know, we just yesterday passed the equinox, which I believe is the sign that lets us know that the next new moon would be the beginning of months or the month of Abib. So we're looking forward to that. Now, whether you discern the, the full moon to be the conjunction or whether you discern the full moon to be the uh, sliver or, you know, the spat, uh, or the first sighting, or you, uh, like us, look at it as the full moon, that equinox should be your sign that you would see that the number of hours a day are the same in the night. We know that the sun, the moon, the stars would be for signs. And I believe the sun is for our sign. And again, when the number of hours of the daylight are the same as the dark, that I believe to be our sign. And then the next thing we're looking for is that new moon. Again, we believe it to be the full moon. Watch our video entitled, The New Moon According to Scripture. OK, go to Philadelphia Assemblies on YouTube and please click on subscribe and the little notification bell so that, you know, when we put out a new video that you will be notified. Now, we're going live here, but we're also simultaneously uh, put, you know, up getting ready to upload this to YouTube. We're recording it now. We'll be uploading it right after the message. So we're going to face towards the east, towards the, where the temple was and where it will be. And we're going to open in prayer. Almighty Father Yahuwah, we praise you, Father, for in all things, in, in, in good times and in these times of tragedy that are going on around throughout all the globe. Father, we know there's a there's a plague that's out there. Father, we ask that that hedge of protection that you promised us would be around all those believers that have that that have come under that shed blood of our Messiah the, over the doorpost of our hearts. Father, we need that extra hedge right now. Father, give us the courage to endure in these times. And Father, give us the understanding to do the right thing. Father, help us not to uh, provoke fear in the hearts of others. But again, we also don't want to provoke uh, for foolishness. You know, let's let's all be uh, sincere and and, and, and keep, continue to keep your commandments and keep each other in prayer in this time of plague. Father, we ask that, again, you would protect and, and, and keep all those uh, of your servants. And, Father, even all those that have not come under the word, uh, under that shed blood, we ask the protection for them, Father, because of that that's family, friends, you know, others that haven't yet made that profession of faith to you and, and are walking in, in newness of life or the commandments. We ask, Father, that you would heal all those that are sick. And, Father, we know some will not survive. And, Father, we understand that our days are numbered just like the hairs on our head. Father, we ask that you would enlighten each one of us today as we go to seek understanding in your word. Father, as we teach this uh, expository teaching of 2 Samuel, Father, give us the words to say and open our hearts to understanding. We ask it all. And your precious son, Yahushua's name. Amen. Okay, we'll go ahead and jump right in now. Uh, chapter Second uh, Samuel, chapter 8, and verse 1. And it says, And after this it came to pass that Dawid, or David in English, smote the Philistines and subdued them. And Dawid took me Methagamiah, and I'm terrible at these names, forgive me, out of the hand of the Philistines. And he smote Moab and measured them with a line. And it says, making them to lie down on the ground, even with two lines measured, he, he too put 
he too put to death, and with one full line to keep alive, and so the Moabites became Dawid's servants and brought gifts. I know that might have been a little confusing, but I tried to, you know, again, give a little better translation here, or a little clearer for most people of the King James translation. Chap verse 3 of chapter 8. Dawid smote Hadezadezer, the son of Rehob, the king of Zobah, as he saw as as he went to recover his strength at the river Euphrates. Okay, and Dawid took from him a thousand chariots. Okay, he recovered from the Philistines that he had smote or killed, and seven hundred horsemen and twenty thousand footmen, and Dawid hamstrung all the chair the uh, chairman and Dawid uh, okay I, I'm reading it again I'm sorry I backed up and Dawid hamstrung all the chariots chariot horses but re reserved of them for an hundred chariots so he saved a hundred horses for the chariots and when the Syrians of Damascus came to help Hadezer king of Zobah Dawood slew of the Assyrians two and twenty thousand men. Then Dawood put garrisons in Syria of Damascus, and the Syrians became uh, servants to Dawood and brought gifts. And Yahua preserved Dawood wherever he went. And Dawood took the shields of gold that were on the servants of Hadakazer and brought them to Jerusalem and from Beta. And from Beothia, cities of Hedezer, king of king. Okay, okay, that's the end of thought there. And Dawid took very much brass or bronze. When, to, when Toai, king of Hamath, heard that Dawid had smitten all the host of, the, of Hedezer, then Tohai sent to Horam, his son, into king Dawid to greet him and to bless him because he had fought against Hadezer and smitten him for Hadezer had wars with Toai and Horem brought with him vessels of silver and vessels of gold and vessels of brass or bronze which also King Dawid did dedicate unto Yahuwah. With the silver and gold he had dedicated all of all nations which he had subdued of Syria and of Moab and of the Ben or sons of Ammon and of the Philistines and of Amalek and of the spoil of Hadadzer, of Hadadzer son of Rehob king of Zobah and Dawid got him a name when he returned from smiting or from killing of the Syrians in the valley of salt being 18,000 men, and he put garrisons in Edom, and throughout all Edom put he garrisons, and all they of Edom became Dawid's servants, and Yahuwah preserved David wherever he went, or he delivered David from wherever he went, kept him alive. And Dawid reigned over all Israel, and Dawid executed or administrated judgment and justice unto all his people. And, and Joab, the son of Zer, Zariah, was over the host, and Jehoshaphat, the son of Ehilud, was recorder, or like scribe. Verse 17, And Zodok, the son of ah, ah, Ahatab, the Ahimelech, ah, the Ben of Abiatha, Abiathar were the priests, and Sariah was the scribe. Okay, so one of them was a recorder, and this one was translated scribe, but it's pretty much the same thing. Now, when you're talking about Zodok and the sons of Zodok, later we'll, we'll understand that this is the priesthood that's restored later. And Benaiah, the son of, G, of Yeho, Yehoda, was over both the Cherethites and the and the Pelethites and Dawid's bin 
or sons were chief rulers, okay, or officers. Chapter 9 of 2 Samuel, verse 1. And Dawood said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Shaul, of Saul or Shaul, that I may show him kindness for Johanathan's sake? And there was of the house of Shaul a servant whose name was Ziba, or Ziba. And when they had called him unto Dawood, the king said unto him, Art thou Zibad, Ziba? And he said, Your servant is he. Or in other words, yes, I'm, the, I'm he. Verse 3, And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Shaul, that I may show the kindness of Elohim unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Johanathan hath yet a, a ben or son, which is lame on his foot. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, or unto Dawood, or David, Behold, he is in the, in the house of Machir, the, the ben of Amael, Amael, Amael. Stop that, Bob. <laughs> in, in Lodabar, in Lodabar. Verse 5, Then King Dawood sent and brought him out of the house of Machir, the Ben of Amael from Lobadar or Lodibar 6, verse 6. Now when Mephibosheth, the Ben of, Yoh of Yohanathan, the son of Shaul, was come unto Dawood. Okay, so again, Saul's son, Jonathan, in English, was come unto David, and he fell on his face and did reverence. And Dawood said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, and behold, your servant. And Dawood said unto him, or don't be afraid, for I will surely show you kindness for Johanathan, your father's sake, and will restore you all the land of Shaul, your father. And you shall eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself, and he said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog or a worthless person as I am? Verse 9. Then the king called to Ziba, Shaul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto your, your master's son all that pertain to Shaul and to all his house. You, therefore, and your sons, or your ben, and your servants shall cultivate or till the land for him, and you shall bring in the fruits that your master's ben or son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, and I'm slaughtering that name, your servant, master's son or ben shall eat bread always at my or always at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen ben or sons. And twenty servants. Verse 11. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my master, the king, hath commanded his servant, so shall your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, He shall eat at my table as one of the, of the king's ben or sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son, or Ben, whose name was Micha, and all that dwelled in the house of Zib Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both of his feet. Now we already read earlier what happened, and the lady had dropped him when she was running and caused him to be lame. Chapter 10. And it came, uh, chapter 10 of 2 Samuel, and verse 1. And it came to pass after this that the king of the sons of Ammon died, and Hanun, his ben, reigned in his stead. Then said Dawood, I will show kindness unto Hanun, the ben of Nahash, as his father showed kindness unto me. And Dawood sent to comfort him, by the hand of his servants for his father, and Dawood's servants came into the land of the Ben of Ammon. 
And the princes of the Ben of Ammon said unto Hanun, their master, think, you, do you think that Dawood doth honor your father that he hath sent comforters unto you? Have not Dawood rather sent his servants unto you to search the city and to spy it out and to overthrow it? Therefore, Hanun took Dawood's servants and, and shaved off the one of their, their beards and cut off their garments in the middle even to their, uh, to their buttocks. So they cut their garments or their overcover all the way up to their hind quarter and sent them away. Verse 5, when they told it unto Dawood, he sent to meet, uh, to meet them because the men were greatly ashamed or humiliated. And the king said, stay at, at Jericho until your beards be grown and then return because they were ashamed. And some say that's why we are to wear beards, you know, because this obviously shows that the guys were ashamed. It also might be that they were ashamed because they had been taken by force and shaved in their beard. Verse 6, And when the Ben of Ammon saw that they stank, or had, be, you know, they had began to stink, before Dawood, the, king, the, the Ben of Ammon sent and hired the Syrians and Bethrehob, and the Syrians of Zobah, 20,000 footmen of the king of Mecha, a thousand men, and of, Ish, and of Ishtab, 12,000 men. And when Dawood heard of it, he sent Joab and all the son of the mighty men and the Ben or sons of Ammon came out and put the battle in array at the entering of the gate. And the Syrian of Zobah and, the, and of Reob and Ishtob and Mech were by themselves in the field. When Joab saw that the front of the battle was against him before and behind, he chose of all the choice men of Israel and put them in array against the Syrians. Got them suited up for battle. Put on the whole armor. Verse 10. And the rest of the people he delivered into the hand of Ab Abishalish, Abishalai, his brother, and that he might put them in array against the men of Ammon, or get them ready for battle against the men of Ammon. And he said, If the Syrians be too strong for me, then you shall help me. But if the men of Ammon be too strong for you, then I will come and help you. Be of good courage. And, you know, have faith, be of good courage, and let us uh, play the men for our people, or let us be men for our people, and for the cities of our Elohim, and, and Yahuwah, do that which seems him good. In other words, we'll go do what we think is right, and whatever Yahuwah does, it'll be okay, because he is Yahuwah. Verse 13, and Joab drew near, and the people that were with him, and to the battle against the Syrians, and they fled before him. And when the Ben of Ammon saw that, that the Syrians were were, flee, were running, then they fled also before Abishai, and entered into the city. So and entered into the city. So Joab returned from the city, from the Ben or the sons of Ammon and came to Jerusalem. Verse fifteen. And when the Syrians saw that they were smitten before Israel, they gathered themselves together. And Hadaz uh, or Zerar <laughs> sent and brought out the Syrians that were beyond the, the river, and that's talking about the Euphrates. And they came to Helam and Shobach, the captain of the host of Hadezer, went before them. And Verse 17, and when it was told, Dawood, he gathered all Israel together and passed over Jordan and came to Helam. And the Syrians sent themselves and set themselves in array. In other words, got prepared for battle against Dawood and fought with him. And the Syrians fled before Israel and Dawood slew the men of the men of 700 chariots of the Syrians and 40,000 horsemen and smote or struck Shobach, the captain of their host who died there. 
And when all the kings that were servants to a desert saw that they were smitten or they were destroyed before Israel, they made peace with Israel and served them. So the Syrians were afraid to help the Ben of Ammon anymore. So that's the end of chapter 10. We're going to go right ahead with chapter 11. And it came to pass after the year was expired, or at the end of the year, at the time when the kings go forth to battle, that Dawid sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the Ben, or sons of Ammon, and besieged Reba. But Dawid tarried or stayed till St stayed still or remained at Jerusalem. Verse 2. And it came to pass in the evening that Dawid arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. We all know what's going on here in this that's where we know if we dwell on sin, you know, on something, then sin lies at the door. And this is uh, the mistake that Dawid or David made. Verse 3, And Dawid sent and inquired after the woman. Now, if he would have just noticed her and went on, this probably wouldn't have happened, but he didn't. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, Elam the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And Dawid sent messengers, again, or malakim. This is talking, this is the same word in Hebrew that they use for angels. Okay, so Dawid sent malakim. So my point in with all that is to, so you don't get on the idea that every time you see the word angels, it's talking about angelic beings because it's not. Sometimes it's talking about human beings and sometimes it's talking about angelic beings this is so and Dawid sent Malachim or messengers and took her and she came in unto him and he lay with her we know that wasn't a good thing for she was purified from her uncleanliness and she returned unto her house so they, Dawid had done something with this woman and the woman conceived and sent and told Dawid and said I am with child and Dawid sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to, unto David, or Dawid. Verse 7. And when Uriah was come unto him, Dawid demanded of him how Joab did, and how the people did, and how the war prospered, or how it went. Verse 8. And Dawid said unto Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a portion of food from the king. And Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his master, and went not down to his house. And when they had told Dawid, saying, Uriah went not down into his house, Dawid said unto Uriah, Did you come not from your journey? When, when then did you not go down into your, or why then did you not go down to your house? Verse 11, and Uriah said unto Dawid, the ark and Israel and, Yo and Yehuda abide in tents, and my master Joab and the servants of my master are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go unto my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your as your life lives or as your body lives i will do not do, i will not do this thing and dawid said unto uriah stay here today also and tomorrow i will let you depart so uriah abode in jerusalem that day and the morrow and the next day verse 13 and when dawid had called him he did eat and drink before him and he made him drunk and at even he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his master, but went not down to his house. And it came to pass in the morning that Dawid wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set you Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and withdraw you from him that he may be smitten and die. 
So this whole time, you know, unfortunately, as good a man as David or Dawid was, he was plotting to get rid of Uriah so that he could make Bathsheba his own. Okay, verse 16. And it came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were or the strongest defenders were. 17. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab, and there fell some of the people of the servants of Dawid, and Uriah the Hittite died also. Then Joab sent and told Dawid all the things concerning the war, and charged the messenger, or the Malach, saying, When you have made the, an end of telling the matters of the war unto the king, and if so be that the king's wrath arise, and he shall, and he say unto you, Wherefore or why approached you so near into the city when you did fight? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Verse 21 Who smote Abimelech the Ben or son of Urabatha, Rabasheth? Did not a woman cast a piece of a millstone upon him from the wall? that he died in the in the Bez, died in Thebes. Why went you near the wall when say uh, when the wall then say you, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the Malak or the Malak, I'm sorry, or the messenger went and came and showed Dawid all that Joab had sent him for. And the Malak or messengers Messenger said unto Dawid, Surely the men prevailed against us, and came out unto us into the field. And we were upon them even unto the entering of the gate. And the shooters shot from off the wall upon your servants, and some of the king's servants be dead. And your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Then Dawid said unto the messenger, or the, Mal the Malach, Thus shall you say unto Joab, let not this thing displease you, for the sword devoureth one as well as another. Make your battle more strong against the city, and overthrow it, and encourage you him. And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah her husband was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the morning was past, Dawid sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife, and bare him a son. But the thing that Dawid had done, despite, I mean, displeased Yahuwah. Now, he had basically preyed on innocent blood. I mean, I mean, think about this. This guy was such a good man that he wouldn't even go back home to be with his wife because other men were out in the field in a battle. And then Dawid sent him to the place where he knew he would be killed. And then he married his wife. And you can see why that would display, displease Yahuwah. Chapter 12. And Yahuwah sent Nathan unto Dawid, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly more flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had brought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him. And with his Ben, or his son, it did eat of his own food and drank of his own cup. And they lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. He loved the sheep, just uh, this female lamb, just like he would a daughter. Verse 4, And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared, uh, okay, he spared to take his own life, his own flock, he, or in other words, he saved his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring or for the traveling man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it and prepared it for the man that was to come, was come to him. And Dawid's anger was greatly kindled against the man because he understood what he was saying. He was speaking in a, in, in, you know, in a parable to him. He says, as Yahuwah lives, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. Okay. So this is this, this messenger that came to him. Let's read on. 
Moloch, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said unto Dawood, now Nathan was the one that came to him, thou art the man. Thus saith Yahuwah Elohim of Israel. Now this is in red because he's telling him what Yahuwah is saying. Okay, not that Yahuwah is saying it. I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered or I rescued you out of the hand of Shaul or Saul. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives unto your bosom and gave you a house of Israel and of Yehuda. And if that had been too little, I would more, I would moreover, I would even have given unto you anything that you asked, such things as such as such things or more. Verse nine. Therefore, hast thou, or for this reason, you have despised the commandment of Yahuwah to do evil in his sight. You has killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and has taken his wife to be your wife and has slain him with the sword of the, of the bin of Ammon. Now, notice again, it says in verse 7, a lot of people not reading it correctly. Okay, it says, and Nathan said unto David, Okay, so this Malachim or this angel is a man. He's not, you know, some angelic being from heaven. It's Nathan, okay? And because it says, And Nathan said to Dawood, Thou art the man. Thus saith Yahuwah Elohim of Israel. Okay, so he's delivering the message. In this case, he's a Malachim or messenger. That's interchangeable with the English word angel, okay? We look at it completely different today than they would have then. Okay. He says, therefore, thou hast despised the commandment of Yahuwah to do evil in his sight. Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. Even he didn't do it himself, but he might as well have. And has taken his wife to be your wife and has slain him with the, word, the sword of the Ben of Ammon. Okay. Verse 10. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me. So it's like a curse that he put on himself that from that whole time, he's going to have nothing but blood on his hands. And for that reason, he wouldn't be worthy to build the temple either, even though that would have been his heart's desire. OK, he says, because you have despised me now. David loved Yahuwah with his whole heart, and that's and Yahuwah even said he was a man after his own heart. But in this instance, he had not, and has taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. And, and again, this is Nathan speaking here, verse 11, Thus saith Yahuwah, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them unto the unto your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. OK, or publicly. That's what that meant. So all these things that had done and you have to understand what's going on here. This is Nathan, the man. The Ruach HaKadosh fell on him and he prophesied and he spoke. Thus saith Yahuwah. OK, so. That's what happened. He was a Moloch or messenger of Yahuwah, but the Ruach is what fell upon him for to speak in this manner. Verse 12, for you did this, did this it secretly. Now this is Nathan speaking here. This is not in red in my sword Bible from 12 on. Okay, so again, he was prophesying. The Ruach was speaking through him, you know, from verses... Um, I'll quote this correctly from verse seven, where it says, I anointed you king. He said he, he himself said, thus saith Yahuwah, Yahuwah Elohim of Israel. From that point on, that was the Ruach speaking through him through the verse 11. Then verse 12, he picks up again for you or, or you know, obviously Nathan picks up again for you did it secretly. But I will do this thing before all Israel and, and publicly or before the sun for all to see. Verse 13. And Dawood said unto Nathan, I have sinned against Yahuwah. And Nathan said unto Dawood, 
Yahuwah hath also put away my, your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given great opportunity to the enemy of Yahuwah to blaspheme, the children also that is born unto you shall surely die. And Nathan departed unto his house, and Yahuwah struck the child the child that Uriah's wife bare unto Dawud, and it was very sick. Dawud therefore appealed to Elohim, okay, or he prayed unto Elohim for the child, or for the, yeah, for the child, and Dawud fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servant of Dawood feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto you, and he would not listen unto your voice. How will he then harm himself if, if we tell him that the child is dead. Verse 19. But when Dawood saw that the, his servants whispered, Dawood perceived that the child was dead. Therefore Dawood said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Verse 20. Then Dawood arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothing and came into the house of Yahuwah which was at that time the tabernacle of the congregation, and worshiped then. He came to his own house, and when he had required, or when he had asked, they set, before, they said, set bread before him, and he did eat. Verse 21, Then said his servant unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou did fast and weep for the child while it was alive, but when the child was dead, you did rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and cried. For I said, Who can tell whether Elohim will be gracious to me, that the child may live? You know, he was fasting and crying and praying unto Yahuwah, Elohim. Verse 23, But now he is dead. Therefore, so therefore, or why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Verse 24, And Dawood comforted Bathsheba, his, his wife, and went into her, and lay with her, and she bare a son, and he called his name Solomon, and Yahuwah loved him, loved Solomon. Verse 25, And he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet, notice that's the one that was prophesying, Nathan the prophet, and he called his name Jedidiah because of Yahuwah. And Joab fought against Rehoboth, Rehoboth of the Ben or sons of Ammon and took the royal city. And Joab sent Malachim or messengers to Dawood and said, I have fought against Reba and have taken the city of, of waters. Verse 28. Now therefore gather the rest of the people together and encamp against the city and take it. At least I take the city and it be called after your after my name. And Dawood gathered all the people together and went to Reba and fought against it and took it. And he took their king's crown from off his head. The weight whereof was a talent or about a hundred pounds of gold with, well, that had been a heavy crown, wouldn't it? A hundred pounds of gold with the precious stones. And it was set on Dawood's head and he brought forth the spoil of the city in, the, in great abundance. And he brought forth the people that were therein or that were in the city and put them under that that were in and put them under saws, I'm sorry, and under harrows of iron and under axes of iron and made them pass through, okay, or made them work through, work with, make them work with the brickland. And thus did he unto all the cities of the sons of Ammon, so Dawood and all the people returned unto Jerusalem. Chapter 13 of 2 
Samuel. And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of Dawood, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. And Ammon, the son of, or the Ben of Dawood, loved her. And Ammon was so miserable that he fell sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin, and Ammon thought it difficult for him to do anything to her. Because it was his sister, obviously. Verse 3, But Ammon had a friend whose name was Yonadab, the, the Ben of Shimea, Dawood's brother, and Yonadab was a very subtle man, subtle man. And he said unto him, Why are you, being the king's son, depressed from day to day? Will you not tell me? And Ammon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. And Yonadab said unto him, Lay you down on your bed and make yourself sick. And when your father comes to see you, Say unto him, I beg you, let my sister Tamar come and give me food and dress and, and prepare the food in my sight that I might see it and eat it at her hand. So Ammon did lay down and made himself sick. And when the king was come to see him, Ammon said to the king, I pray you or I beg you, let Tamar, my sister, come and make me a couple of cakes in my sight, that I might eat it at her hand. Verse 7, Then Dawood sent him to Tamar, saying, Go now to your brother Ammon's, ho Ammon's house, and prepare food. So, that Tam so Tamar went to her, brother and to, to her brother Ammon's house, and he was laid down. And she took flour and kneaded it, and made cakes in his sight. She mixed it together and made cakes in his sight and did bake the cakes. And she took a pan and poured them out before him, but he refused to eat. And Ammon said, Have out all men from me. And they went out every man from him. So got everybody away from him. Verse 10. And Ammon said unto Tamar, Bring the food unto the chamber that I may eat of your hand. And Tamar took the cakes which she had made, and brought them unto the chamber to Ammon her brother. And when, he, and when she had brought them unto him to eat, he took hold of her and said unto her, Come lie with me, my sister. And she answered him, No, my brother, do not force me. So force me, for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not you this folly or this foolish thing. Verse 13, and I, where shall, and I, where shall I cause my shame to go? And as for you, you shall be as one of the fools in Israel. Now therefore, I beg you, speak unto the king, for he will not withhold me from you. Verse 14, however, he would not listen unto her voice, but being stronger than she, forced her and lay with her. Then Ammon hated her great intensely, so that the hatred with, with, wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherein with he had loved her. And Ammon said unto her, Arise, be gone. Verse 16. And she said unto him, There is no cause. This evil is sending me away is greater than the other that you did unto me. But he would not listen unto her. Then he called his servant that ministered unto him, and said, Put now this woman out from me, and bolt the door after her. And she had a garment, or she had a full-length robe of various colors upon her. For with such robes were the king's daughters that were virgins apparelled. Then his servant brought her out, and bolted the door after her. And Tamar put ashes on her head, and tore her garment of many of many colors that was on her, and laid her hand on her head, and went on crying. And Absalom her brother said unto her, Hath Ammon your brother been with you? 
But hold now your peace, my sister. He is your brother. Regarding not, regard not this thing. So Tamar rem reminded, remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. I remained quiet. Verse 21, But when King David heard of all these things, he was very angry. And Absalom spake unto his brother Ammon, neither good nor bad. So he, held, he didn't say anything. For Absalom hated Ammon because he had forced his sister Tamar. And it came to pass after two full years that Absalom had sheep shearers in, in Baal Hazor. And we know Baal means master or lord, Hazor, which is beside Ephraim. And Absalom invited all the king's men or sons. Verse 24, And Absalom came to the king and said, Behold now, your servant have sheep shearers. Let the king, I beg you, and his servants go with your servant. Verse 25, And the king said unto Absalom, No, my son, let us not all now go, lest we be uh, burdened unto you be a burden unto you and he and he urged him however he would not go but but blessed him verse 26 then said absalom if not i pray or i beg you let my brother amon go with us and the king said unto him why should he go with you verse 27 and absalom urged him that he let Am Amon and all the ben, or the king's ben, or sons, go with him. Verse 28. Now Absalom had commanded his servants, saying, Mark, saying, Mark you now when Amon's heart is merry with wine. So in other words, watch till he's uh, merry with wine or had too much to drink. And when I say unto you, strike Amon, then kill him. Fear not. Have not I commanded you, be courageous and be valiant. Going to have his revenge for him molesting his sister. Verse 29, And the servants of Absalom did unto Amon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons, or Ben, arose, and every man got him up upon his mule and fled. Or, and they didn't have mules probably in those days, so that's probably donkey or burrow. And it came to pass while they were in the way that tidings came to Dawood, saying, Absalom hath slain all the, ben, the king's ben, or sons, and there is not one of them left. Then the king arose and tore his garment and lay on the earth, and all his servants stood by with their clothes torn. And Yonadab, the, the ben of Shimea, Dawood's uh, brother answered and said, Let not my lord or my master suppose that they have slain all the young men of the king or the king's ben or sons, for Amon only is dead. For by appointment or for by mouth of Absalom this hath been determined from the day that he raped his sister Tamar. Verse 33. Now, therefore, let not my master, the king, take the thing to his heart to think that all the king's men or sons are dead, for Ammon only is dead. Verse 34, but Absalom fed, fled, and the young man that kept the watch lifted up his eyes and looked, kept watch, in other words, watched out. And behold, there came many people by the way of the hillside behind him, and and. Yonab, Yonadab said unto the king, Behold, the king's ben or sons came as, they, as your servant said, so it is. And it came to pass as soon as he had finished of speaking that behold, the king's sons or ben came and lifted up their voices and cried. And the king also and all his servants cried very bitterly. Verse 37, But Absalom fled and went to Talmea, the son of Amihad, king of Gershur. And Dawid mourned for his son every day. 
and Absalom fled and went to Geshur and was there three years. And and the heart of the king Dawid longed to go forth unto Absalom, for he was consoled concerning Ammon, seeing he was dead. We're going to stop right there. That's 55 minutes. We're going to end today with a reading from 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 P Peter chapter 5. I think this is fitting with the uh, plague that's out there. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of Elohim, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walks about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist firmly in the faith, knowing that's what we need to do. We need to resist, you know, temptation, fear, and all those things in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in our brethren that are in the world, whether they're under that blood or not. Verse 10, but Elohim of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by the Mashiach, Yahushua, after that he have suffered a while, might make you perfect, stabilize, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And may Yahuwah be with you and keep his hedge around you and may give you wisdom and understanding until we meet again. If you have any questions or comments, concerns, you can contact us at philadelphiaassemblies at gmail.com. And again, if you would, go to YouTube, the, the Philadelphia Assemblies. It's just Philadelphia Assemblies, okay, on YouTube. And click on subscribe and also click that little bell. May Yahuwah bless until we meet again.